Well, first of all, thank you very much for allowing me to, 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 to be here. Um, you might not know this, but when you win one game in your first season, you don't get asked to speak a lot of places. So the Holy Spirit is definitely here tonight, folks. <laughs> I'm just, oh, what, what a blessing. You know what? I'm the son of a minister. It's my first time ever speaking in, in a church. First time ever standing at a pulpit. And that is not something that I take lightly. And I would not uh, pretend to stand up and... and and um, try to speak the word of, of God as my father would or as Pastor Charles just did. I, I think it's important that I stand up and, and talk about my life and the things that the Lord has done in my life. So I'm going to be honest with you guys tonight as much as I can. And um, I just want to make sure I say before I get started, uh, thank you so much for having me here because it's a great place to be and it's, it's inspiring to be here with you tonight. I want to make sure I thank Pastor Graham and Pastor Stevens and Ron Murph uh, for allowing me to be here. Um, you know, when you're a football coach, you get asked to speak a lot of places, but usually when I speak, the kids in the room, they, they have no choice but to listen to me. And if they don't pay attention, I get to run them the next morning at 6 a.m. And the other times I speak, uh, the guys pay because they want to hear me talk about inside zone and outside zone and playing, you know, 3-4 defense and all that. So this for me is probably um, one of the most challenging times I've ever had a chance to get up and speak. So I appreciate that, and I'm grateful for that. And what an honor it is, and I, I thank the Lord for allowing me to be here uh, tonight. Um, it's funny, my wife and I drove up here, and as we were driving up here, I asked my wife for permission to talk about her and my life together. And, uh, you know, I see some of there's some young, you know, young people in this room, and I was the, I was the son of a, the, the preacher, my dad was a minister in New York City, uh, went, to, went to seminary in, in Kansas City, and, and my whole life, I knew the Lord and I loved the Lord. My whole life, I asked my dad how long church was going to go. <laughs> my whole life, I went to church on Wednesday night, I went to church on Saturday. My whole life, my dad had to smack me upside the back of the head when he wasn't preaching, telling me to sit up. I grew, I grew up in the church. And so many times when we grow up in the church, we know it and it's there with us and it's comforting with us, but we haven't found it ourselves. We haven't experienced it ourselves. And so I wanted to share a few minutes of what it's like, what it was like for me growing up as the son of a preacher, as I entered into coaching and the things that I found in my spiritual walk and where I am today. You know, so often when we go to church, we get up and we, we, we listen to the pastor and we know that we're all sinners saved by grace, but we, we listen to people that get up and speak to us about their faith, and they, you feel like when you're sitting in the pews, like they kind of have it figured out. So many times when I'm sitting there, I say to myself, like, man, he's talking to me. And it's not like when you're a football coach, you don't go to the clinic, and you, know, you go to the clinic and you listen to Coach Saban. You don't listen to the coach that just got fired. You listen to people that have it figured out. And I'm here to talk to you tonight about about my faith and about this topic of manning up, because you know what? I don't have it figured out. I'm a failed Christian at every step in my life. And thank God, thank God for his grace, because you know what? I'm still here. Man up. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. We had mat drills this morning, which is like where the kids walk into a, a room and I yell and scream at them and the coaches yell and scream at them for an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. And we keep yelling to be a man and man up. And, and I see my son at 13 and I see those young people that I'm coaching and do, do, they, do they know what that means? Do they know what it means to, to be a man? Am I showing them what it means to be a man? And so as I had this opportunity to come talk, and I talk to them all the time about what I think it means to be a man, to do what you're asked to do, to treat people well, to all these different things that I talk about, to be honest, to be accountable, to be trustworthy. I started thinking about the day that I decided what kind of man I was going to be. See, I'm here to talk to you about two conversations in my life that I had with my father. The first one, and I'm blessed, my father is a, was a high school football coach, was a high school teacher, and was a minister. And when I came to Baylor, first got started, and things were rough, and things were tough, and I said, I picked up the phone, I called my father, I called my mother, I said, hey, could you come down to Waco and help me out? I need you. And one of the blessings in my life is that I have a chance to have my father in the office. He actually shares my office with me. 
And every morning at nine o'clock, he comes in, he gives a little devotional. I started that this spring. And just a week ago, just like Pastor Charles has talked about, he, he read Matthew 6, encouraging me to seek first the kingdom of righteousness, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and in all things will be added unto me. I mean, I knew that my whole life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I knew that. I, I remember getting, uh, uh, if, if I had the right amount of Bible verses growing up, I got to go to wherever I wanted to eat, and I got to order a, a Sunday. Like, I knew that verse my whole life, but it was that time when my father said, it to, said that to me, and I was getting ready to come here, that my life flashed before my eyes. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. And I had a chance, and I only have a few minutes here, so I'm going to go a little bit faster, as if this Yankee up here doesn't talk fast enough, so please forgive me. But I remember flashing back to another conversation with my father. As I sit there in my office and my 13-year-old son, Bryant, as Neil, I'm grateful for him to bring up, and my four-year-old daughter, Leona, my two-year-old daughter, my four-year-old daughter, Vivian, and my two-year-old daughter, Leona, and I remember flashing back to sitting in Wall Park in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on the phone with my father. My son at the time was, I don't know, five or six, and telling my father that my wife and I were ready to call it quits. I had enough. I said, Dad, I've tried. She just doesn't get it. Don't get me in trouble now, guys. But telling my dad, the hardest conversation, saying, Dad, you know, we have decided we're done. It's over. My wife and I, my, Julie and I, we just, we can't do this. And I know it's wrong, and I, I, I'm praying, and I'm at, but you know what? We just cannot make it work. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. It was at that time in my life my dad posed a question to me and asked me what kind of man I was going to be. Asked me what kind of father I was going to be. Was, was I prepared to live in a life where, prepared to live in a world where my father was going to be raised by another man? Where my son was going to be raised by another man? Was I, going, was I prepared to live in a world where I was no longer the husband to my wife? And I went back and I had to ask myself, like, what does it mean to be a man? See, I, I wasn't cheating on my wife. I wasn't caught up in pornography. I wasn't caught up in all the things I thought ended a marriage. I was just chasing the wrong kingdoms in my life. I was working 24-7. And all the time I kept saying, well, I'm being a great father. My son was born with, with, with some difficulties. I was providing for my son. I was sending my son to a private school that he needed. I was paying for all the things my son needed. I called my wife, I texted my wife, we went to dinner. But I wasn't being the servant leader at home that God had called me to be. See, my parents taught me at such so young of an age, and it was at that time I had to realize I had to have expectations in my life with purpose. And I was living just on expectations. I expected to provide for my family. I expected for my kids to have everything they needed. I expected to be successful, but I had no purpose in it. I was doing all that to say that I did it. I was doing it, if I'm being honest, because the ultimate kingdom in my life was the kingdom of me. I tried to hide it. I tried to lie about it. I tried to pretend it wasn't there. I tried to name it, all these other things. But at the end of the day, I like turning on the TV and seeing my face on TV. At the end of the day, I like hearing my name talked about as one of the best coaches, young coaches in college football. And I made a decision. By the grace of God, I made a decision to seek his kingdom first. To go back and beg my wife to let me back in the house. Again, I had this picture of, of marital dispute as being like, she caught me doing, no, it wasn't that. But she had gotten so used to a life without me that she was ready to move on from a life without me. She had gotten so used to me not being there that she was used to me not being there. And I went back. And if you met my wife, that wasn't a short trip. That wasn't a, I love you, I love you back. That was a journey. That was work. See, I came to Baylor this year, and as 
Neil, Neil said, you know, we start the process of rebuilding Baylor football. And every day I'd wake up and I'd say to myself, like, what's going to happen today this season? And I'd read Nehemiah. And I'd read about Nehemiah going back and rebuilding the wall. Not with the strongest of people, not with the best of the best, but with a sword in one hand and a shovel in the other. And I realized, you know what, I've done this before because I did this in my own life. And I didn't just do it with my wife. See, I think sometimes we say to ourselves as men, well, you know what, my marriage is what it is, but my kids know I love them. The ki our kids are feeling the same things our wives are feeling. They just don't tell us till they're older. They just soak up every chance they can get from us till they're older. And I was tired of seeing that hurt in my son's eyes because I just wasn't around enough. I was around, but not enough. I was on this. Can't shoot baskets on this. Can't shoot baskets talking to the top recruits. So as I came into Baylor, I've rebuilt something way harder in my life. I've rebuilt my family through the grace of God, not by changing what I was doing, but by changing my purpose, having the same expectations. I expected to be excellent as a coach. I expected to win. I expected to recruit at a high level. I expected to provide for my family. But I expected to be a servant leader in all that I did. I expected to be there for my wife in all that I did. So that was the hardest rebuilding job of my life, way harder than Temple University. And it was the greatest, the greatest rebuilding job in my life. Because about five years or six years to the day after I sat there and spoke to my father, I called my parents and told them that where we had once been told by doctors we would never have a child again, that we were having a daughter. And two years after that, I had a chance to tell my, my parents, you know what, and my, my wife, we had a chance to share the joy and the love of a second daughter. Because we had rebuilt our family, not on promises, not on talk, not on improvement, not on self-help, but because I had changed my focus. My purpose was now just to serve the Lord in every part of my life, to raise my son to be the leader that God wanted him to be, to be gentle with my family but still be tough, and to be gentle with my teams but still be tough, just as Nehemiah had did. So that's what I come here to share with you today. So often I, I think back to that time and say to myself, you know what, there were so, so many times where I would say to myself, you know what, as I was going through this, and this is what I want, if there's any young people in here, this is what I want them to hear. Because this was the thing as a young Christian, I always had such a hard time with, I always said to myself, well, well then I guess, you know what, I just, I'm just going to go out and do my best. And I thought about, you know, I have to rebuild my family. What am I, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out and I'm, I'm going to quit coaching. Or I'm going to go down and I'm going to coach at, the, at another level. I'm going to go somewhere where it's not quite as demanding. That's not, what, that's not what the Lord wants. He does not want me to lower my expectations. He just wants me to increase, not, not even increase, he wants me to change my purpose and fix my eyes on him. My expectations can still, still be the same. You know, this morning in Bible study, and I, you know, you don't need me to read you a bunch of Bible verses, but, but one hit me that it's one that I love, and I just want to read this to you. It's Galatians 6, 4. And I think this is so, so important for the young guys in here that, you know, like, you get started in your profession, you're trying to figure out, it says, pay, this is the New Living Translation, because I like the way it sounds. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. God was not calling me to stop working. He was just calling me to work in the kingdom of my family, to work in the kingdom of my son. He was calling me to work in his kingdom for his purpose, knowing that if I did that, the blessings that he wanted for me would come. And so now as I go to work each and every day, as I went to work on Sundays this season after we lost, I went into that office with purpose. Because God wasn't calling me just to win, though he expects me to win. He was calling me to coach with purpose. Teams that lose need a coach. Just like teams that win need a coach. Now, I don't plan on coaching a team that loses very often. If there's any TCU fans in here, God bless you. But 
God, my Jesus, my Jesus, asked me to go into that office each and every day this year, each and every day this week, and rebuild my team just like I rebuilt my family. One day, one conversation, one kind word, one relationship at a time. You know, I'll end with this because I'm coming up on the end. And as a football coach, you learn to talk quick and get off the stage. But I had a player today that's, you know, on every team, the young, there's always a young guy and he's a little bit, you know, overweight and he struggles in the off-season program. And, you know, we try to teach accountability and you're always kind of getting on a guy. And you get on a guy and you say, oh, oh you guys do it again because of so-and-so. And they kind of look at him like, pick it up. And after about a week, he starts to doubt himself. And this morning, that young man that had been struggling, had been doing a great job, you know what? He did a great job. He did a great job this morning. And I'm blessed to have wonderful men around me that, that recognize that with no agenda. And one of them said, you know, so-and-so was elite this morning. He did a great job. And so I saw that young man, and, you know, sometimes I have a tendency to always be the disciplinarian. And, and I said, you know, well, what, what does he need today? What, what shape of love does he need today? What shape of Jesus does he need today? And you know what he needed? He needed somebody to tell him, you know, you did a good job this morning. So I picked up my phone and called his mom, who I haven't seen since I finished recruiting him. Lives in another state. And picked up the phone and called his mom, and she's gotten a couple phone calls from me. So it wasn't like the, hey, Coach Rule, how you doing? It was like, oh, Coach Rule, what's going on? <laughs> and I picked up, I said, hey, your son has something he wants to say to you. And I handed him the phone, and he went in the other room, and he had a chance to talk to her. And he said, you know what, I, I, I was elite. I did a great job. And I, he handed me the phone, and I put it away and thought nothing of it. Thought nothing of it. And before I was seeking the kingdom of heaven, before God was helping me through all of these daily interactions, before he was teaching me that my life, my coaching, my purpose on this world is about relationships, not about anything else, not about my job, but just about relationships, I maybe wouldn't have done that. I just said, he got to prove it to me. He, gotta, he needs two days. He needs three days. I didn't like the way, he, but not today. And I'm driving home and I get a text from his mom. Single mom, hardworking, wonderful woman. She says to me, you know what? She sent me a text. Hey, coach, you know what? I appreciate that today. She said, you know, I, I needed that today. I found out I was diagnosed with cancer just two days ago, and I'm going in for surgery next week. My son doesn't know yet. She said, I, I, I appreciate everything you're doing. You know, pray for me. Keep me in your thoughts. That's not me. Those words that I heard when I was sitting in the pews when I was a young, young child took me about 30 years to figure out what they truly meant. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. When I go home tomorrow morning and I see those two little girls that my pride and my envy and my heart and my ambition almost didn't allow to be here, I thank the Lord. My prayer for each and every man in this room is that we don't lower our expectations. We just make sure our ex expectations have purpose. God bless you.